Hey everybody, I've been doing astrophotography now for about eight years, and in today's video, I want to explain how we went from taking photos like this to taking photos like this. Now, of course, a lot of this just comes down to practicing and going out there night after night, learning how to do your polar alignment, focus, and everything else. But in today's video, I'm going to explain four variables that'll have a big impact on your final image. And they are the camera gear that you're using, how much light pollution you're shooting through, how much total exposure time you have, and your processing skill. And so if you can improve on all four of these variables, you're going to see that your progress in astrophotography really starts to speed up. Let's start off and talk about processing first, because this is the one variable that's completely under your control. It doesn't matter if you live in a light polluted city, if you have a lot of cloudy nights or you don't have the best camera gear, you can always sit down at the computer, learn new editing techniques, and ultimately improve your final image. And I think one of the best ways to demonstrate this is actually with some of my own photos that I took about four years ago. This data was captured in Kanab, Utah back in early 2020 with an ASI 1600 monochrome camera, a cheap set of ZWO filters, a Red Cat 51 telescope, and actually a Skyguider Pro. This is before I had a go-to mount. Now because this was my very first time using a monochrome camera, I wasn't quite sure how to process the data. And so let's take a look at my first draft. In this very first image, the photo looks okay, but the composition's a bit tight and I don't really like that anymore. Also, if we were to zoom in, you can actually see that none of the stars even line up properly. That's because I didn't realize that you had to align all your color channels yet. So obviously the first draft was not very good. We also had some green stars and overall, not a great photo. So I went back a few days later, processed the image again for version two, and this is definitely a step up. The composition is a bit better. The overall mood of the image is okay, but it's still kind of flat. The colors are a bit strange still needs some work. Then in 2022, I went back to the image for the third time as part of my deep space course update. And I got to say, I still think this one looks really nice. I've got a nice red color there on the nebula finally. The background dust is now visible. The stars are finally fixed. But I recently went back for the fourth time, processed the photo again using my latest workflow, and got this. I realized that the pink and magenta might be the first thing you notice. You either like it or you don't but that's more of an artistic choice. From a technical standpoint, this version is the best yet. If we zoom in, you can see there's a lot of detail there, but the photo is also very clean. And if we zoom back out, I think overall, the color balance of the image really is a nice change. Overall, I think it looks great. If we compare that to the original, I think it's a night and day difference. And again, my point with this image is to show you that I used the same exact data from four years ago, but I learned how to process it better and vastly improve the final image. And for those that are interested in learning how to do this, I did just upload a three-part series here on YouTube for my channel members, and that's also available on Patreon. That'll walk you through my entire workflow, and I give you all of my files so that we can practice on your own and really start to improve on your workflow. Now, before we move on, I wanted to show you how much data I actually captured on this target. If we look here, I only had about 20 minutes per color channel. Then I got about an hour for luminance and about an hour for H alpha as well. So even though my total integration time is close to three hours, I would argue that if you only have 20 minutes per color channel, you're never really going to get enough data for a nice photo. Although we saw just how far you can push it if you know how to edit your images. Let's take a look at another photo now of the Orion Nebula. This was taken in the same spot, same time, same gear. We have version one here, which looks okay. The background just kind of flat though. Orion is just kind of boring. And there's also a bit of a green color cast throughout the photo, which I didn't realize at the time. I went back a few days later, processed it again, and got this version, which is just a minor improvement. But if we zoom into the core, you can see that the HDR blend I tried didn't work very well. And it's just kind of flat and boring there where there should be some more color. And about two weeks ago, I went back for the third time, processed this data again, and got this result. The big change now is you can actually see some of that fainter dust there in the background, which is a nice change. Also, the HDR blend went a lot better. And again, from a technical standpoint, it's cleaner, more detailed, and it's a better photo. Now let's take a look at how much data I had. As you can see here, it was just 10 minutes per color channel, which is kind of pathetic, honestly. 
I don't know why I was shooting such short exposures and why I only had 30 minutes total, but that's just another reason why you want to capture more data for a cleaner photo, and that will also allow you to pull out that fainter dust a lot better. And while I was at it, I did take a look at a few of my other photos to see how far I could push them, and in almost every case, the photo was much, much better than my edits from two, three, four years ago. So I hope you're starting to understand just how important it is to practice your editing. And again, it doesn't matter if it's cloudy outside or you can't travel, you can always work on your editing skills. And this one fact will have a big impact on how your astrophotography portfolio looks. Let's move on to our next variable, which is your total exposure time. In fact, I've already done a separate video that explains everything you need to know. So I'd recommend you check that out. But I'll just distill that video down very quickly. The first thing I want to note is that if you want a clean, detailed photo, try to get between four and eight hours total per target. That should give you enough data to work with so you can process the image very effectively and minimize the grain. However, there's a lot of variables that will affect how much total exposure time you need, including your camera gear, your filters, your amount of light pollution you're shooting through, the phase of the moon, etc. So I'm giving you rough guidelines today, but some people might need to get 16 or even 32 hours of data for something similar. Another big takeaway from that video is that you always need to double your total exposure time for noticeable improvement in quality. So even if you have 16 hours of data for one target, if it starts to fall apart during your editing, well, now you need to try to get 32 hours total to see any sort of benefit. Then again, as we saw today, even in just 30 minutes, I was able to get a decent Orion photo and about an hour or two for Horsehead, that one looked pretty good too. So this is why these four variables are always kind of like a juggling act where if you can really improve your processing, then you can probably get away with a little bit shorter exposure time or getting to a more light polluted area or not. So this is why you wanna to try to improve on all four of these variables to quickly speed up your astrophotography process. Our next variable is light pollution. And this is probably the worst one because we have so little control over it. However, even if you're shooting from a light polluted backyard, there is a fairly inexpensive and easy solution. What you wanna do is purchase a narrowband filter. And this will depend if you wanna use a color or monochrome camera. But for my color cameras, I use just a cheap Optolong L Enhance. What this filter does is it blocks out all the light pollution and it lets in the wavelengths coming from the nebula, mainly H alpha and oxygen. So now, even if I'm in a Bortle 5, 6, 7, 8, it doesn't really matter. I can just focus in on the North American nebula, the heart nebula, the horse head, whatever. As long as it has a lot of H alpha, I can get a nice shot. And in this way, you can now get great images from your backyard without having to drive to a darker sky. This can really help to increase your experience setting up and processing if you can get that data. However, the Optolong L Enhance and many other narrowband filters are not designed for broadband targets. Things like the Andromeda Galaxy, the Pleiades, the Iris Nebula, things like that. So if you would like to photograph those targets, that's when it pays to go out to those darker skies, spend a few days down there, and capture some great data. And that's kind of the way I look at things now. Because I'm up here in the Pacific Northwest, we only get a few clear nights per month, so normally I'll put on my Optolong L Enhance when I'm shooting here in the Pacific Northwest. And then when I go to Kanab every year or so, then I'll just focus on my broadband targets because I know I don't have any light pollution to contend with and I can get some great data down there. Another important tip for light pollution is you want to think about where the targets will be in relation to the big cities near you. For example, if you live north of Columbus, anything in the southern sky is most likely going to be drowned out by all that light pollution you'd be much better off aiming towards the north and photographing the targets up there. Or you can always drive away from the big city so you have a clear view to the south, and that would also help out. But these are the things you want to keep in the back of your mind. And I realize some of you might be thinking, okay, I know I need to get to a darker sky, but how much of a difference does it actually make? And I've got two photos here that will hopefully explain that for you. This photo of the Milky Way galaxy was captured in probably Bortle 5 to Bortle 6 up in northeastern Ohio. You can see the Milky Way, but it's pretty dim and faded against the background sky. This photo of the Milky Way, though, was captured in southern Colorado. Now it stands out much better, there's almost no light pollution, and the Milky Way takes on a whole different character. And if we put them side by side, again, the main difference is the contrast. 
The photo taken in Bortle 2 has a lot more contrast in the sky. The photo taken in the Bortle 6 has a lot less contrast. And the way that would translate in your photos is that if you're shooting a nebular galaxy through a lot of light pollution, you'll have to stretch the photo further in post-processing and add more contrast. As you add more contrast, things like dust spots, vignette, color model, color grain, horizontal or vertical banding from your sensor, all of these problems become much more apparent in the final image. And so if you're shooting in a light polluted area, everything becomes more difficult, including the processing. And this is why you always need to get out to a darker sky whenever possible, especially for those broadband targets. However, if you are shooting with the proper filter, then you're cutting out most of that light pollution and it's not as big of a concern. The final variable is your camera gear. And I actually don't like talking about camera gear very much because I realize for most people, this just comes down to your budget. If you can't afford it, you can't afford it. And I don't want people to feel like they have to spend money to get better photos. However, I do have an important analogy for you. If you're trying to build a house, you need the right set of tools. If you show up to the house building site and you have a few rusty nails, a screwdriver, and a knife, you're not going to be able to do very much. The same is true for astrophotography. If you show up to astrophotography with a 20-year-old DSLR, a 70 300mm kit lens, a $15 tripod for example, those tools were never designed for our hobby and you're not going to get great photos. And this is why I advise everybody to get the right tools for the job, including a dedicated astro camera, some sort of telescope, a proper filter depending on your light pollution, and a go-to mount if possible. So let's start off with cameras, because if you're using a DSLR like I did, that's fine. But really there's three main reasons to consider upgrading to a dedicated astro camera. The first is the cooling system. Believe it or not, as your sensor heats up at night, it starts to generate more noise. And there's really no way to cool down a sensor other than just the ambient air temperature. So if you're shooting in the summer in the desert, you're kind of out of luck. Whereas with the dedicated astro camera, you can tell it, hey, I want to shoot minus 20 degrees Celsius tonight and it will do its best to reach that temperature and stay there all night long. And you'd be surprised at just how much grain a hot sensor will add to your photos. So if you are still using a DSLR, one of the best things you can do is minimize your live view usage, which will really heat up the camera and the sensor. That's really the only thing you can do. So that's the first main reason. The second would be the filter that's pre-installed on your sensor. Every single DSLR has a UV IR cut filter that's pre-installed at the factory. This will block all the unwanted ultraviolet and infrared light from hitting your camera sensor. However, most of these filters are a bit too aggressive and they block most of the H-alpha light that we want to photograph. This is arguably the most important wavelength out there for astrophotography. And on an average DSLR, you're only getting maybe 20 to 30 or 40 percent max of that wavelength. So now you have to shoot much longer exposures and more of them to get any sort of detail out of the Horsehead Nebula or the Heart Nebula or anything like that. I realize that you could get that filter removed on your DSLR and a lot of people go that route. For me personally, I don't think it's a good investment though because I'd much rather put that money towards a camera that was built for astrophotography. Because when they're building a DSLR, they don't care how it performs for astro. They think, well, is this good for weddings, portraits, landscapes, wildlife, whatever. Astro is probably the last thing on their mind with the exception of those one-off A cameras like the RA from Canon, the DA-10A, etc. One other important difference between a dedicated astro camera and a DSLR is the quantum efficiency. And that's just a fancy term for how effective your sensor is at actually using the light that reaches it. Think about it, that light traveled millions of light years to reach your camera. And if you have a low quantum efficiency like a lot of DSLRs, that data is basically wasted and it's bouncing around on the sensor and it's not actually reaching the pixels. But on a good dedicated astro camera, the quantum efficiency is usually much higher. Now you're actually making the most of the light that's entering your lens or telescope. And I hope you're starting to see why you'd want to get a dedicated astro camera over your DSLR when you can afford it, of course. This brings us now to telescopes versus camera lenses, because if you have a DSLR, you probably have a camera lens. And the question I always get is, well, if I've got a good telephoto lens, why do I need a telescope? Are the stars any better? Is the performance that much better? What's the deal? And it's not necessarily that the performance is any better. It's just that, again, a telescope is built for astrophotography. When they're building a telephoto lens, though, 
they're mainly focused on sports and wildlife, and so that's what the lens is designed around. Point being, there's a good chance that your stars won't actually be very sharp, you might have distortion across the image, and a pretty heavy vignette. Another reason to go for a telescope is that it will make your night easier. A lot of refractors, like the ones I use, have a 2-inch filter thread built in. So now you can take that Optolong L Enhance, screw it right into your telescope, and you're all set. If you have a telephoto lens though, there's not really a great way to install those filters. To make matters worse, a telephoto lens does not have a way to attach an auto guider and guide scope, which is critical for shooting longer exposures without star trails. And that means you have to find a workaround like attaching the auto guider to your camera potentially, and that's just a lot of extra headaches you don't want to deal with. The final reason to go for a telescope over a telephoto lens is the focusing system because most telephoto lenses are built for autofocusing cameras. And that means just the slightest little touch on the focus ring, and now your stars are completely blurry. Whereas if you get a good telescope, you have a very smooth, precise focuser, and that'll make it much easier to achieve sharp focus and keep it there all night long. Finally, we have your mount. And a lot of people, myself included, don't want to go out and spend $2,000 plus on a mount if they're just getting to the hobby. So they generally spend four or 500 bucks and get a star tracker. This works great for Milky Way and some deep space, but there's a few problems with the star trackers. The most noticeable is they have a very low payload capacity. You only put about seven or eight pounds before the motor starts to get overloaded. In addition, they're not generally that well built. You'll run into some problems here and there, and you have to find everything manually, which is arguably the worst part of using a star tracker. So if you're shooting from a light polluted area and a narrow band, you're gonna have a hell of a time finding anything with the Sky Guider or a Star Adventure or anything else. This is why most people eventually upgrade to a go-to mount. And so now you can just plug in whatever you want to photograph, even from a light polluted area. It'll go right to that spot, compose it up for you, and now you can start shooting in just a few seconds. These go-to mounts also can support much larger telescopes if you want to go that route. And they're more reliable and they have better tracking. However, my problem with the go-to mounts was always that they were big and heavy and you had to control it with a hand controller, which was an absolute nightmare. But now that we have products like the ZWO AM5, it's a whole nother story. You cannot control the entire mount, camera, telescope, filters, everything from your iPad or your iPhone or Android, whatever. And this makes your life much, much easier. In addition, the AM5 in particular is lightweight and portable, and I can take that with me around the world. Good luck trying to do that with an EQ6R Pro or an AVX mount or anything else. So as we look back at our gear recommendations today, the big takeaway is that if you want to make your life easier, you should invest the money. With that said, I see a lot of people make the mistake of starting off with a giant Celestron telescope that has like 2,000 millimeters. If you go that route, you're just going to make your life so much more difficult than it needs to be because now you have to have precise tracking, you have to have precise guiding, you're probably at F10 so you're not getting much light. All these problems compound and make the hobby not very enjoyable. And that's why I've had so much fun over the years using a small, lightweight setup, which includes just a dedicated astro camera, whichever one you want to go with, a Red Cat telescope, or even the Ascar V. I'm having a lot of fun with that one as well. And now the AM5. With this sort of gear, I could even climb mountains with it and shoot from the top, as I did in one of my videos. Or, if you're trying to get out to a darker sky, maybe you have to fly on a plane to get there. Well, all of this gear should actually fit in your carry-on if you're very careful with it. But good luck trying to fly with a Celestron C8 telescope and a big mount, it's just not gonna happen. And this is why I prefer lightweight and portable gear, which is what I discuss in my gear recommendations article on my website, which if you wanna learn more about all the gear, you can check that out, that'll explain things a bit better. And that's all I've got for you in today's video. I've explained the four variables that will have a big impact on your final image, including your camera gear, light pollution, your total exposure time, and your processing skill. What I'd like everybody to try though this winter is to focus on two of those variables, which are increasing your total exposure time and practicing your processing. This won't cost you any more money and you can continue to improve on your image quality. So even if you only get two or three photos by the end of the winter, that's okay. Those photos are gonna be a lot better than the thing you've done before. And if possible, again, try to get a proper light pollution filter if you are in a light polluted area and then if you have the funds for it, really consider upgrading your gear if you're using a DSLR, a telephoto lens, and a star tracker. Once you have the right tools for the job, 
it's going to make your night so much more enjoyable. And I think you'll have a lot more fun doing Astro Guitar if you're moving forward. So that's all I've got for you today. Again, if you want to see how to process the Horse and Nebula, I do have now my three-part series here for channel members and on Patreon. Be sure to check that out. That's all I've got for you today. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in another video.